Okay, guys, I'm going to jump into this pretty quickly. Um, per usual, I've already run through the code, so we're just going to go through cell by cell and talk about it. Um, to review, this is a multi-crypto use case using Finarel. The first thing we'll need to do is import the kinds of packages that we'll need. Um, for instance, I like to put in these usual suspects here date time and then to start we're just going to need the feature engineer the data split and a, a config called indicators like most data science projects there's a step-by-step -step process to building out a reinforcement learning project uh, the first thing we need to do like most projects is to get our actual data so that's what we're going to focus on at first and then we'll go ahead and do the training We'll set up our agents and environment um, and all that good stuff too. And then our, finally we'll back test. But to start, uh, I just set my train dates and trade dates. So another way you could think about this is like, this is our training data, start and end date. And then this is our validation data, uh, beginning and end date. I should probably change the trade aspect to make it more clear, but essentially we're gonna train on 10 months of data, and then we're gonna validate on two months of data. And the symbols we're gonna be using is BTC, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, USDT, uh, BNB, which I think is Binance, XRP, Sol, and Dogecoin. Now, I use Yahoo Downloader. You could use Binance or Alpaca. Finarel supports those two data sources. The reason I don't use it here is because it's a little bit more verbose in terms of the code where you need to you know, set your APIs and get the client. And it, I found this video was taking me long enough to do to begin with. And so when I went for it again on this approach, uh, I didn't want to mess around too much. I just wanted to get the data and see if I could get something to work. And so this, this does work. But we could definitely put something here that says feature improvement would be to use Alpaca slash Binance. And the reason we would use Alpaca or Binance is because A, the data might be more accurate, but more importantly, C, if we wanted to do something that was a little bit more granular, uh, we would need Alpaca or Binance because I don't think Yahoo, it only does day by day and we would want maybe more granularity where we're trading hour by hour or something like that. Um, another thing, looking back on this, uh, this isn't a ton of data here day by day, right? We've only got, our shape is 5,000 days um, and eight columns. It's enough to do the project, but ideally, we would want way more. But again, this is just a way to get this to work. I had so much trouble getting this to just work. And it's mainly because of the tutorial um, that is on the AI for Finance uh, repository is, it, it requires a lot more dependencies and it doesn't seem to integrate well with a lot of other Finarel packages, which is really weird that they would do it that way. Um, so I just wanted to get something to work first, and then we can go back and start altering things. But this is our data. Uh, we have our ticker symbol, our day, volume, open, high, low, close, and date. Next, we pre-process the data. This is just feature engineering where we'll add in our indicators. We'll get our VIX, our turbulence, and we have no user-defined features at the moment. And then we go ahead and process that. And you can see that the shape of our data frame changes to 503, and we have eight columns here, which it looks like we still have eight columns here. But what we're doing is creating a new data frame that we then process fully. So if we take a look at our new data frame here, we have a bunch of other symbols. We have our turbulence, we have Bollinger Bands, RSI, uh, it's MACD there, moving averages, whatnot. So now we want to iterate through each 
unique ticker symbol in our list. Basically, we want to make sure that for each date of for each ticker symbol, we need to do a little bit more processing where we fill in any zeros, where we fill in any missing values. We also want to sort our dates and tickers symbols. So we just continue to do a little bit more data arrangement so that when we pass through our data frame into our agent in the environment, um, that everything's consistent and it's sorted in a way that is um, that is that is correct, right? So if we take a new sample of our data frame, it looks something like this, very similar to what we have up here, but um, it's just making sure that the date and the tick are up front, sorted correctly, and then attached to the correct data for the I open, high, low, close, volume, turbulence, and all that good stuff too. So it's just an extra step, um, but we're pretty much done there. We can just split the data into train and trade date, or in our case, a train and validation data set. And you can see that the length of our training set is just over a thousand and our validation sets just under 400. You can save that if you want to continue to work on it. So now we're going to do training, testing, and making the environment. First step is to make the environment. And you say, and you can see here, we'll be modeling our environment as a stock environment because CryptoEnv built into Fineral Meta doesn't integrate well with other Fineral pipelines. So oddly enough, on their tutorial, they've like uh, basically an entirely custom pipeline that doesn't fit well with other pipelines that Fineral uses. And so I couldn't just call the crypto environment up here because there are things in that environment that aren't integrated into the training or testing functions of Fineral. So then they also created custom train and test functions that worked only with that environment. And that environment required that you download a package called, I think it's called libta or ta lib, and which stands for a technical indicators library. And I hear it's a good library, but it's also kind of difficult to set up for some reason. And I'm not sure why. Um, I'm not sure why. It was taking me forever to get done. And I wanted to make a FNRL video guy for you guys. Um, so I was just thinking about it, and the only difference here in this data frame would be the ticker symbol. Everything else is kind of like a stock in a sense where you have a stock, you have a high open, low close volume, it's traded on a particular day, and we have all these technical indicators that help us realize some sort of trading strategy. And since it's day by day, this it's pretty much the same frequency and it's also the same we're trying to extract the same kind of uh, strategy where we're maximizing our sharp and selling when it's high and buying when it's low and using the technical indicators to decide price actions but i sort of digress i could see where people are going to get maybe a little upset here um, i'm sorry just know that like Getting a crypto environment to work would require me to write an entirely new crypto environment, and I was trying to do that, but basically all an environment is is just a way for an agent to explore the data frame here at any given moment, right? So if the data looks and behaves exactly like other assets for the most part, it's traded the same in most cases. It's not like a futures asset. It's not like a some kind of options or Forex, right? The way you trade a crypto is essentially the same way you would train a vanilla asset class. So I'm going to go ahead and use stock uh, in a stock environment to make this work. Um, but, you know, feel free to... Feel free to, you know, get mad in the comments or whatnot, or tell me what I'm doing wrong here. But we basically set it up the same way. We're going to call our stock trading environment, and we just didn't need to make some calculations for that environment. 
like the buy and cost list, the number of stock shares, it's going to equal zero times the number, the dimension of our stock list, right? Which is just the unique um, ticker symbols. Our state space is one plus twice the stock dimension plus the length of the indicators times the stock dimension. So our state space, our stock dimension is six. We have six unique symbols and our state space is 61. Uh, that's basically, I think it's like two days worth of total data, basically, I think is what that is um, for our window at any given state. So uh, the next thing would be to set our buy list and sell list as well as our number of stocks in the beginning. We also set our initial amount, which we're going to say we're going to start with a million buckaroos here. And now we're just going to set the other environment settings. We're going to initialize our environment. And then we're going to go ahead and vectorize that environment. We then can initialize our agents. And this is a single agent environment. So what we need to do is just choose which model we want to use. In my case, I'm just going to use A2C. Um, I did, I guess, initialize PPO, but for the rest of the code, I'm just using A2C. But this is a good boilerplate method for choosing and playing around with different models. Uh, you just initialize all this, and the rest of the code will say, if this is true, then go ahead and run this. So the next packages we'll need is from stable baselines because that's the ATC RL package that we're going to use. I've tried to play around with elegant RL. Sometimes it runs into integration things, problems, which I hear is common, something I'm trying to work through because I would like to try different reinforcement learning agents like from yeah, elegant RL. But stable baselines is a is a classic contender. Uh, this is just a way to create, like, if you want to go to your tensor board, we can do that here. And then we go ahead and train. We just pass through our model. We're using A2C. Our total time steps, which in my case, I did 50,000. It's going to train. And then we can save our model doing it this way. And then we're going to test it. We basically set up the same environment. Only this time we're passing through our validation t uh, set here. And we go ahead and run that. And we create a prediction on that. It'll hit end when it's created its prediction. And then we go ahead and back test the results for that. Uh, what's cool is there is a, the first column here is essentially our account value. And we set that as the index, or sorry, we set the date as the index. And the only other column left is our account value. We just initialize a data frame called result because what we're going to do is our result is going to be a data frame where we put our agent's performance. And then we're going to do uh, something to back test it against. So we set up our, our data frame. And this is essentially what the account value looks like over time. The first month, we did very good. And then by the time it hit the middle of November, we started coming back down um, and we just kept going down towards the end of the year. But we need something to compare this against. So how would this do if we were using a mean variance optimization model on our own set of symbols here? Um, thankfully, the people at maybe most valuably because MVO optimization is actually incredibly useful and often beats Fenerel and most other optimization frameworks. So at least in backtesting. And the guys over at AI for Finance have written out a really good method for getting an MVO portfolio. Uh, they wrote these two functions here, process data frame for MVO, which sets it up, stock returns computing, calculates weights and averages return of covariance matrix. I know it says stock returns, but really it's gonna calculate any it's going to calculate any return and covariance matrix given any assets that appear and behave like a stock, which crypto trading does. So then we go ahead and do that on our trade and trade date, converted NumPy. I'm not going to go into this too much, but we compute the asset returns on our data frame for that. 
we get the average returns and we get the covariance matrix using NumPy. NumPy. Uh, we set our precision. This is just saying like how many decibel points do we want? Uh, and then we can print out our returns and covariance matrix, which looks like this. You can see we have one, two, three, four, five, six, six, uh, I guess, values there, or six columns you could think of. That's important because we need to calculate the, the clean weights average for each column here. Uh, so our range is six in that instance. Uh, we use something called the Efficient Frontier using pipe fopped. I've used this in the past. Very, very nice package there for this as well. So it's going to calculate the max sharp uh, using that. We're going to clean the weights. There's There must be some mega calculations going on there that I'm not aware of. Um, but just know that you can clean the weights calling that. And then we clean the weights for each, each value in our covariance matrix, um, which gives us our actual MVO weights. Then we apply that to all the prices and we should end up with something like this over time, right? So I know that was a hastily explained mean variance optimization. I have a whole video on this that goes into it a little bit more detail. But just know if you want something quick, the, these three cells here calculate the MVO for pretty much any portfolio, as long as it's kind of like a stock, as long as it behaves like a stock. OK, cool. So then we just combine those two things, those two data frames into one. We merge them, and we use the date as our index to join on. This is our new data frame. We can compare the two, and you can see the mean variance optimization just kicks butt in comparison. So the mean variance optimization probably did so much better in its testing data that it outperformed up here. So definitely, if you're going to choose between the two, you definitely want to go with mean variance optimization. Now, that's not to say it's because mean variance is better. It's most likely that the way I set up the agent to perform on this data was done really poorly. For instance, it didn't have a whole lot of data to train on. So the predictions it's making it, you could think of it as it's undertrained. It's just not going to make the best predictions because it doesn't. It didn't have enough time to learn how the market worked. Another thing is you could say the environment wasn't very good. It wasn't custom to the crypto environment. Um, again, I would push back a little bit and say, well, what exactly about a crypto environment is different from a stock environment when they're when they behave mostly the same way, and the strategies around trading them could be derived in the same manner. I mean, I'm totally open to being wrong here. Uh, I could see how you would want to do it on a more high frequency and not a day by day. And I could see how maybe the state is continuous and not discrete. For instance, the market closes for a stock, but it doesn't close for a crypto. I could see how big difference in the way that the environment is set up. But assuming, you know, the time differentiator there has to end somewhere, right? So you could say, well, I'm only going to trade crypto day by day. I'm not going to trade it hour by hour. In which case, you know, then it's behaving exactly like a stock. Yeah, I hope you guys found this enjoyable. This is at least a working prototype of that asset class. And it's been a while since I did a FinRL. If I were to do this over, I didn't realize that the dates um, we're so close together. It's partially because I was prototyping this. But yeah, um, let me know what you guys think, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.